Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, April 28, 2024. Its main focus is on Jesus' response to the accusation of some that he was driving out demons by Beelzebub. The message to all who will listen is Jesus has overcome the power of the enemy. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. All right, here we go. We're on an adventure every time we go into God's Word because His Spirit's here, He's going to talk to you. He may say something that I didn't even know that I said. Sometimes that happens. It's okay. You pay attention to God, okay? Whatever He says to you, it may be something completely different than what I say out loud, but that's okay because He just wants to use this time to get you to the place that you hear Him. So pay attention. Amen? God, thank you that you are right here with us, that your spirit lives within those who are who have their faith in you, who have their faith in Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would do your work through your spirit and that you would accomplish your purposes in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You have no idea how strange or interesting or whatever depending on your perspective, things can get when you type Beelzebub into the Google search bar. I did that this week because, as you'll see soon enough, Beelzebub's name gets thrown around a bit in Luke chapter 11. Uh, Actually, the NIV has it as Beelzebul with an L at the end instead, but Bub is what I remembered when I did my Google search, so that's what I looked up. I did not know much about Beelzebub, that's why I went looking, outside of the fact that it means Lord of the Flies. You've heard Lord of the Flies, that's the title of a novel, right? Yeah, okay. Well, that's Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies, Uh, but now I've been enlightened. Google has helped me out, and I know more than I want to know. I'm going to share just a little bit of the facts with you for fun. I'm not sure that talking about demonic things can be classified as fun. But speaking of classifications, there are, I discovered, a number of classifications of demons, both ancient and more recent. Beelzebub shows up in many of them. And so I'm going to share with you one of those classifications. The one I'm going to share connects different Uh, devilish princes with each of the seven deadly sins. You've heard of those? They're kind of famous, sloth and pride and envy and lust and all those other things. So we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm going to share a few of those facts with you. Uh, This happens to be from a tract that was created by John Wycliffe. You know Wycliffe translators? He was one of the first people to translate the Bible, and he had this tract, and I'm I'm going to read this for you. And we're going to see what happens. Remember, as I read this, this is not biblical information. This is historical. Got it? Because we don't have these things in the Bible. I'm just telling you. Here we go. So here's the classification he had. Uh, Talking about the seven princes of demons. The first is Lucifer that reigns in his malice over the children of pride. The second is called Beelzebub that lords over the envious. The third devil is Satan and wrath is his lordship. Fourth is Abaddon, the slothful be his retinue. You don't use that word every day, do you? Anyway, the fifth devil is Mammon and has with him the avaricious. That's greedy. And also, fittingly, a foul sin, covetousness, is with his company of subjects. The sixth is called Belphegor, that is the god of gluttons. The seventh devil is Asmodeus, or Asmodeus, that leads with him the lecherous. You heard Beelzebub's name in there, right? That's what we're focusing on. According to Wycliffe, he is the lord of the envious. Not that it matters a whole bunch, but there are others who... Uh, in other lists that rather than Belphegor, he's also the Lord of the Gluttonous. So there you go. Now you know a little bit more than you knew about Beelzebub and perhaps more than you ever wanted to know about him. But we're gonna, he's going to come up. So 
I don't know where Wycliffe and the others who made lists and hierarchies of demons got their ideas, their information, but they're part of the history of this particular named demon that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 11. And I know that doesn't say Luke chapter 11. That's because there's one other place in the Bible outside of the Gospels where Beelzebub is mentioned. And so we're going to take a look at that because biblical information is better than anything else, right? So we're going to look back at the book of 2 Kings, the very beginning of that book. There's this story, well, where Beelzebub, although his name's spelled a little bit differently, where he shows up. And so we're going to take a look at that. So we're starting at the beginning of chapter 1 of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Okay. After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Azariah, that's the king of Israel at the time. Now Azariah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this, journey, this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elisha the Tishbite, Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there's no god in Israel that you're going to consult Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, Why have you come back? A man came to meet us, they replied, and he said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and tell him, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to consult Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. The king asked them, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They replied, he had a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. The king said, that was Elijah the Tishbite. Then he sent to Elijah a captain and his company of 50 men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. How many of you remember that story from Sunday school? Probably not. Too much burning flesh, maybe? I don't know. Actually, uh, the interesting thing is that if we had read farther on, there's more burning flesh. Another cap captain, his company of 50 come and they get burned. The, the third group has a smart captain. He says, have mercy on us. He starts with that. He doesn't start with the king's message. He starts with, please have mercy on me and my people. And so God does have mercy on them. And they get then Elisha goes with him to the king. Long story short, the king dies, as God said he would. So, anyway, we can, what we learn about Beelzebub or Baal, Beelzebub is that he's the god of Ekron, a false god, probably demonic in nature. Uh, but Ekron was one of the main cities of the Philistines. You've heard of them, maybe, the Philistines? You know Goliath, the super tall guy that I can't even reach the top of his head? That guy that fought against David and, and got... Stoned? Yeah? All right. Sorry. little 70s humor. Anyway, so Goliath was from Gath. He was one of the Philistines. Uh, he, so Ekron, this is their god, Beelzebub. Back to 1 Kings chapter 1. The reason Ahaziah is confronted and condemned by God or by Elijah's message from God is because he's trusting in this enemy God, this foreign God, rather than in Yahweh, the, the God who rescued the 12 tribes of Israel from Egypt and established Israel as a nation. This act of rebellion, along with other sins in his life, are why Azariah, or Ahaziah, I'm sorry, Ahaziah, that's why God's judgment falls upon him. We won't read the rest of the narrative, but spoiler alert, he dies. I think I said that already anyway. And because he has no son, someone else takes the throne to rule the wicked northern kingdom of Israel. Now, there's lots and lots more to learn about Beelzebub. If you want to go looking, I 
think it's ill-advised, but you can do that. Um, don't do it now. Stay with me. We're going to talk about important things like Jesus and what how he deals with accusations concerning this particular demon. So let's uh, let's get started in Luke chapter 11. We are ready for verse 14. We're going to read 14 to 16. These three verses kind of act as an introduction to this longish discussion of Jesus' power over demons. We're also going to hear what people think of him in the upcoming section, so pay attention. If you found Luke 11, follow along. I'm going to read verses 14 to 16. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. So let's pause for just a second and make sure we don't just skip over the fact that Jesus just performed a miracle. Because we can get all caught up in all this other stuff and the thing that precipitated this weird discussion about whether he's demon-possessed or not started because he cast out a demon who was mute and the guy spoke. Don't miss that. Jesus casts out a demon. He has power over them. And as soon as the spirit was gone, the man could speak. Amazing, right? The crowd thought so. It says so in, the, in, that, in, that, in this passage. You have to be a special kind of something, crazy, envious, dumb, vindictive, or whatever, to look at this sort of thing and say, demons made that possible. He did that by the prince, uh, one of the princes of the underworld. I'm not saying that evil beings can't perform miracles. They can. And they can do so in order to deceive people. You see that in the book of Revelation, that there's going to be false prophets who perform miracles in order to deceive and lead people astray. But I'm simply saying that this particular sign or wonder, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't look like Jesus is trying to deceive people into following after other gods or in rejecting the Father. So those in the crowd who suggest that Beelzebul or Beelzebub is the source of Jesus' healing power have one aim, and that is to discredit Jesus, to turn the crowd against him. You can see the prince of demons angle isn't the only one they tried. There are people who just witnessed an act of God or a sign from heaven who asked for another. Wasn't that sign enough? I mean, mute guy speaks. That'd make the evening news, wouldn't it? Jesus doesn't respond to the request for a sign immediately. He will respond, but first he has to address the Beelzebub did it thing. And what he says is amazing. So let's take a look. We're going to read 17 to 20 now. It's in this paragraph that Jesus makes laughable the accusation that he's cooperating with demons in order to cast out demons. So read along with me. Starting verse 17, going through 20. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided itself against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. If I dry out, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus in his first sentence destroys the logic, just like reason, destroys the logic of those accusing him of demon on demon warfare. It makes no sense. If there's infighting, the kingdom of Satan is doomed. Success does not happen when there's bickering and boxing and battling in house. You know that's true. It happens in families when they're at odds with each other. We've heard stories of churches that become divided or when there's office bickering and whatever. We used to have girls, well, we still have girls, but we used to have girls who were in middle school JV volleyball. And I can tell you when the girls start yelling at each other, the game's over. 
it's true probably at high school level too and college maybe but when teams start teammates start fighting against teammates you might as well just put the ball down and go home unless you can get it figured out anyway it seems that things are no different in the spiritual realm than they are in in our in the world satan's kingdom is doomed if satan is or his princes or whatever are kicking each other out of possessed people. That's what Jesus is saying. It makes no sense. Why would Satan kick Satan out of somebody? Makes no sense at all. Honestly, can I tell you something? Satan's kingdom's doomed whether he does that or not. Uh, because the demons and the devil, they're, they're battling God, and God is greater by far than Satan or Beelzebub or any other prince of demons or the minions, whoever. God is greater than, by far than all the forces of hell combined. It is not a fair fight. God the creator is omnipotent, all-powerful. There is no other like him. The devil and he are not equal and opposite. That's yin-yang. That's, that's nonsense, according to God's word. God is all-powerful. No one else is. Don't forget this when you're praying for breakthroughs in the spiritual realm. Know that if your kid or your friend or your neighbor are under the influence of the enemy, if you pray for them and they turn, God is going to win that battle. He's going to rescue those people who are under the influence of the enemy. This is true for your personal warfare as well. Trust God and he will see you through to the other side. You will have the victory because of Jesus in you. The one who's great in you is greater than the one who's in the world. You've heard that in the scripture. That's the truth. Jesus is in this instance and in every other instance recorded for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, driving out demons by the finger of God demonstrating God's authority over all evil. And I kind of love that picture that it just takes God's finger to drive out demons, kind of like, kind of flicking them, like you flick a fly off the thing. Yeah, anyway. I know that's not always what it feels like when you're in the midst of the fray, but it's what's happening. God is overwhelming those who are against you. If God is for you, who can be against you? The enemy has no defense when you call upon God for help. No power over God's will for your life at all. None. Have I been clear enough? God wins every time when men and women submit to him and allow him to rule in their lives. Satan loses, Beelzebub loses, all hell loses. The theme continues in the next verses. Let's read verses 21 to 26. Luke 11, 21 to 26. When a, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That last bit's a little weird, isn't it? We'll get to it. We're going to start with the strong man first, though. Let me ask you this. Who is the strong man that Jesus is talking about? That's a question. Who's the strong man in this? Any ideas? All right, I'll tell you. It's this, It's Satan. The context gives us a clue. Jesus has just finished about up talking about a house divided against itself, about a kingdom battling itself, and this is the next thing he says. Satan is the strong man here, and God is the one who is stronger, who attacks and takes away his armor. 
defeats him, armor, he plunders the dominion of darkness. He does this for his glory. That's why he could cast out demons was because the finger of God was with him. He's the one who's stronger. That makes sense? So Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, talks at length about this unseen war that's raging around us, and he tells the church, that's us too, how to deal with spiritual attacks as they come. So I want you to listen to what Paul wrote. Again, I'm reading Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. It may be familiar to some of you, but pay attention to what you and I are instructed to do. There are numerous instructions to believers, so pay attention as I start at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6. Did I say 2 earlier? Okay. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then. You get the idea you're supposed to stand? Okay. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So you and I, and I'm assuming here that you're a believer in Jesus, if you are a believer in Jesus, you and I are able to stand up against the enemy because of God's mighty power. We take our stand in his power, and we're good. If we stand in our own power, uh uh-oh. We are dependent upon God to win our spiritual battles, period. Partly that's because we don't see what's going on as well as he does, but mostly it's because he's God and we're not. So put on your armor through prayer, but remember it's your connection with God that's the game changer or the battle changer. The win is his in all circumstances. Back in Luke 11, verse 23 is pretty straightforward. You're either with God or you're not. So so choose sides. Choose your side. I think you know which side I would recommend. It's the winning one. And now for the weird paragraph. About spirits going out and coming back, about possession, repossession, about demonic reinforcements, taking over empty houses. Really weird stuff, right? So what in the world is Jesus saying? Now, lots of people have asked that same exact question. I can tell you that. Admitting these verses are a bit on the puzzling side, we need to look at them and try to figure out, is Jesus talking about being saved and losing salvation? Is he warning that Christians who have been freed from bondage can be rebound? I'm not sure there's a simple yes or no to those questions, so I did a bit of digging and after some time located an article published by the Gospel Coalition, and uh, it's written by Ray Orland, a writer that I've heard and read before, who has some really good things, and so I want to read a few excerpts from that to help us to understand. Here's what it says. A demon is comfortable with a human being who has been tidied up, who is sinning less than before, who looks good and smells fresh, and even quotes 1 Corinthians 14.40 about all things being done decently and in order. Swept and put in order is no bulwark against evil. This teaching of Jesus reveals how vulnerable is purely negative repentance, turning from sin without turning to God getting free of bad habits without getting bound to newness of life in Christ. Any moral reform that creates a mere mere vacuum will be filled by evils worse than before. Our only safety is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Escape from evil is not found in neutrality, not even in well-manicured neutrality. Our only safety lies in welcoming and revering and rejoicing in the kingdom of God coming upon us in divine power. When the kingdom of God gets us glorying in the commanding presence of Christ, then the demons tremble. Managing sin is not enough. You need God's power to overcome. You need to be submitted to him and his rule in your life and allow the spirit to do his work or you're going to keep sinning and your sins are going to pile up upon each other. You're going to keep failing. Freedom is in Christ alone. There is no freedom apart from him. Amen? So let's read the next two verses from... I'm sorry. There. The next two verses from Luke 11. There won't be much to say about verses 27 and 28, but we're not going to skip anything, so let's read. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. (laughs) Someone in the crowd thinks Mary is more blessed than others. She is blessed to be sure, blessed because she obeyed God and allowed him to bring his son into the world, but no more blessed, Jesus says, than those who hear God's word and obey. That's literally all I'm going to say about that. We're blessed if we hear God's word and we obey it. You remember the people asking for a sign way back in verse 16? We're finally going to get to that Jesus' response to that. So let's take a look at verses 29 to 32. This is his response to them thinking that he needed to give them another sign from heaven. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation." The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. You know the story of Jonah? The righteous prophet runs away, gets caught in a storm, gets thrown overboard, gets swallowed by a fish. Three days he's in the fish, and then, sorry, he's on the beach with a new lease on life. It's time to go preach if you get vomited by a fish, right? (laughs) Okay, so Jonah goes where he's, he's supposed to go finally, and he proclaims God's message And just as Jonah suspected and didn't like the idea of, the people repent. They turn from their sin and God relents. Uh, Jonah's not happy about God's decision, but that's another story for another day. So Jesus' point is this. You ask for a sign, but you're unwilling to submit to God's rule. To God's call for repentance. That's what Jesus' message was and continues to be, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. How did these religious leaders he was talking with respond? They accused Jesus of being in league with the devil. They said his works were the works of the enemy. Jesus is going to get killed over some of this. He's going to be in the tomb three days. He's going to revive. That's the sign of Jonah that he's promising. He's going to die, and he's going to resurrect. Will the resurrection be enough to draw these men who hate him into the kingdom? Will it cause them to repent? For most of them, the answer is no. They will reject him as their savior and will be condemned. little secret, after the resurrection, in the book of Acts, it says that many priests came to believe. So, some of them got it eventually. Listen, 
you and I will be condemned if we refuse to submit to Jesus' rule and enter into the kingdom. If we refuse to put our trust in him, if we refuse to turn away from sin and to God, if we, if we don't believe on Jesus and follow him, obeying his commands, if you don't believe and obey, you're not in the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. You're not a Christian if you pray but don't obey. Some in Jesus' day, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the thieves, the lowlifes, heard Jesus' words and they turned away from their sin. They repented, they changed their ways. But some, the religious elite, the priests, the teachers of the law, and some scoundrels that they employed for various purposes, heard the same words and rejected them. They ignored God's call to repentance and hated the one who issued that call. Who gets salvation? The first group or the second? It's the first group, right? The sinners who say, I'm, I need this. The sinners who turn away from their sin and, and choose to follow God. Those who repent are welcomed into God's kingdom. My prayer is for, for you is that sooner rather than later that you would turn from your sin and turn to God. I urge you to believe on Jesus. He's the only way. Faith in him is it. Believe and obey. Make Jesus Lord of your life and enter into the kingdom of God and live for him and find joy in the spirit doing through you what God wants to do. We're going to take a few moments in silence, and I urge you to respond to God in whatever way he, you need to respond, when it, in whatever way you need to respond. Choose repentance today. Turn away from your sin and to God. Choose obedience. Choose kingdom life. Choose faith in Jesus. Trust in God that what Jesus did on the cross paid for your sin and what he's done in resurrecting is it will give you life in him. So I'm going to give you a few moments in silence after I pray, and I'm inviting you to put your faith in Jesus and to follow him and obey him. God, without repentance, there's no salvation. And both sides of repentance, not only trying to clean up our life, or that's not repentance, trying ourselves, but God, there's repentance of sin turning away from it and turning to you by faith in Jesus. God, I pray that each person who hears this message would be confronted with that. I thank you that many have put their faith in Jesus already, but God, if there's any that haven't, I pray that your spirit would do your work in their hearts right now. Speak to their hearts, speak to their minds. Draw them to yourself through your son Jesus. I pray that your spirit would be at work. God, I thank you for the salvation that you provided through Jesus and, and the life of freedom that he offers, that you offer through him. God, help us to hear you. Help us to obey you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.